So we're going to start today's uh, equity conference by looking at the art of fundraising. And uh, whether you're uh, a tech startup on your uh, first round or perhaps uh, an established business looking for uh, dynamic growth, getting investment, as you well know, can be a, a very challenging process for uh, business owners and entrepreneurs to navigate through, uh, especially, uh, let's be honest, the first time round. So there are obviously practical tips and advice businesses can adopt when raising equity to make this process much, much easier for all parties involved. So to discuss this, we have a wonderful lineup, a terrific panel of experts. Joining us remotely, uh, we have Lucy Mayer-Page, the Commercial Director of uh, Vista Retail Support, a Cardiff-based technology support company in the retail sector. Uh, who I think have benefited from a number of rounds of equity investment. Uh, Lucy also sits on the uh, ICAEW Wales Strategy Board. Lucy, good to see you. Thank you very much for uh, joining us. Jonathan Hollis is here, the uh, managing partner of Manside Ventures, uh, based in London. Uh, Manside are investment accelerator fundraising advisors with uh, something of a mission to optimise the fundraising process between European startups and investors. Jonathan, welcome, good to see you. Joining us here in the studio, a very great pleasure to welcome Alex Lee, a senior investment executive in the Technology Venture Investments team at the Development Bank of Wales, who specialises in early stage technology-led businesses uh, looking to uh, raise equity finance. Patrick Dodds is here, Dr. Patrick Dodds, C uh, CEO of uh, Hexagon Inhibitors, which is a Swansea University spin-out uh, that secured investment and services uh, in the anti-corrosion additives market. Uh, Patrick, welcome, good to see you. Shuan Rees, uh, the program manager, the senior program manager at Impact Innovation, the advisory firm uh, who work with uh, public and private sector clients to support business and economic growth through effective innovation and smart investment. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel, it's a very, good, a very great pleasure to see you all uh, and welcome. Let's start first of all with mindset, which has, has to be absolutely crucial in all of this. Business owners can be reluctant, I think, to see a decrease in their ownership percentage through uh, equity. Let's be honest, let's be fair about this. And it's often, I think, about a fear of losing control, isn't it? Shuan, let's start with you. As someone who works with a lot of uh, developing and accelerating businesses at uh, Impact Innovation, um, what's your experience on this? What's your view? We're scared of giving away, aren't we? Absolutely, yeah. I think as part of, obviously, the work that we do on the Accelerated Growth Programme, um, which is part of the Business Wales High Growth Support for High Growth Businesses, we do have um, a lot of reports coming back from our relationship managers that actually highlight exactly that. They are very concerned about dilution. Ultimately, the control that they have um, over their businesses is probably their paramount concern. And of course, that does vary according to which stage of fundraising that they actually are. Um, what we do find is actually that the ones, or the entrepreneurs, if you like, that are less concerned are the ones that have taken the time to become what we deem as investment ready. So have also gone through their own um, preparation, their consideration for percentages of, of ownership, what that means in terms of uh, their sort of, if you like, return, what do they expect as a return for that potential ownership, and equally, how does that offset some of the concerns around control. And what we do advise our business is that you have to be able to be in a position where you take control of the process. So you have the information that you think is paramount to your own relationship with your investor and equally what that means in terms of what you're gonna get back from that particular sort of partnership, if you like, in terms of investment. Giving away, taking back control. Taking back control. Where have we heard that before? <laughs> <laughs> Alex, okay, Alex Lee, and um, what about your take on this? I mean, you have vast experience in this field. Uh, how do you see it? It's a very good question. I think the way, the way I see it is it's not giving away, it's selling a, a portion of equity uh, with the view of the, the portion that you retain growing that. And so it's getting the cash into your business and I think the, the reason why it's so important is the pace of technology and business is so fast. And yes, you could bootstrap it and go at it alone. However, you risk being taken out by your competition. Mm. So if you get in an equity 
provider. They will help you, you know, support you on that journey. And in terms of the control, you know, investors just want your business to succeed. And if you've got a credible investor on board, uh, you know, particularly an institution, you don't have to worry about them taking over your business because they don't want to do that. They want to let you run the business. They just want to be investors. So uh, I don't see a downside. Jonathan, um, you advise both uh, investors and businesses, uh, of course. Uh, what's your experience? How do you see this? Um, I, I agree with the comments <coughs> that have been said um, so far, and I think that it's critically important for founders to read and understand the investor consent. Mm -hmm. So when you, when you talk about control, it's all around the veto rights that investors have on the business. And I think, A, it's important to understand what they are. And as Alex mentioned, you know, investors are there to go on the journey with you. They're not there to block the, the business. But it's critically important to understand what those controls are. And, and secondly, there's always room for a bit of negotiation. And so some of these investor consent, um, if you feel particularly worried about one or two of them, you can actually have a discussion about those with the investor and then you can calm those fears by actually understanding why they're there and if there's any room for negotiation. Okay, um, Patrick, uh, you're the CEO of this uh, university spin-out. Uh, you went on to get uh, investment. I mean, it's a great story, but um, for those who don't know it, uh, can you tell us a, br a brief story about this, this journey, this story? I think coming from a, a university perspective, uh, the, the strong point for us is that we've, we're based in science and we have patents. To realise those patents, though, you need to take investment. Um, they can't just be sat on. They don't just create value. So to create value, you need to build a team. Uh, and if you've got a science technology-based company, then you need to have your product validated, and that takes time. And this is where, for us, uh, the company wouldn't exist if we hadn't got the equity investment. Um, so it's, it's a point of getting you started. Uh, bringing on value add investors as well. Um, so with that equity, uh, you, you bring experience to help you grow the company. You are going to give away some control, but you've got to understand that you, you are giving away part of your company for money to help grow the company. So you've got to be comfortable with that. And I just want to focus on mindset because that, that, that's what we want to look at here. And just tell us, just take us back to your mindset at the start of the story. I think there's a, there's a fear of equity. Uh, especially if from the university space, there's a, people don't understand it. Institutionally or, or as individuals in the university? Institutionally um, uh, and as individuals, they don't have experience of going through the process. We were lucky that we had someone going through the process with us, uh, so we could be talk, they could talk us through each step, each way, so we can understand. Then the next round of equity investment, we're not fearful of what's going to happen. We, we un once you understand the process, it's not as bad as it seems. It's interesting, isn't it? I, Shu, and I just want to just pick up on a couple of points, uh, just because it's important to drill this down, the sense that you're not giving away part of your business, mm -hmm. uh, that you, you are selling it in exchange for money from people who want you to succeed Absolutely. and be successful. Exactly, and I think there is almost a need to really, uh, and I think what we've heard from sort of this discussion already is there is a sentiment that actually it is about success. It's about success on both parties sort of sides. Um, and it's not being, um, I suppose, focusing on, obviously, like Patrick just said, that element of risk, the negativity that sort of somewhat sort of, if you like, clouds the opportunity for equity, because let's sort of almost be completely um, of the mindset that actually this is about developmental opportunities. It's about sort of having the... Um, shared common goal with your um, sort of your matched investor that actually this is going to subsequently drive the business forward and actually help you in the growth ambitions that you've obviously shared as part of that investment journey and alex just a final thought on, on this particular subject i mean surely better to have 80 percent of uh, a million pound company than a hundred percent of a five hundred thousand pound company absolutely and and just to come full circle on it the consent rights and the veto rights are just that they are veto rights they aren't you know they are you, the investors aren't on the executive team making decisions for you they're just saying if you come with a decision they want to make sure that's in the best interests of the company the shareholders and to help you grow that equity value so it's just that final backstop as opposed to taking control away from you uh, and your business i want to move on if i may because we've got a very tight schedule here and i want to move on to talk about 
preparation next, uh, if I could. And, 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 and raising equity uh, capital can feel like an almost full-time job sometimes. Balancing your time is absolutely important, isn't it? Uh, let, me, let me bring in uh, Lisa Mayer Page. Um, Vista has successfully raised funds with a number of uh, different investors. I wonder if you can just tell us uh, a bit more about that. I'm particularly interested on v Vista's growth journey. Yeah, yeah, by all means. Um, so my experience is with Vista. Uh, Vista was a, um, a management buyout that was backed by Finance Wales back in 2008. Uh, at the time, it had a turnover of about six million. Um, we we had another management buyout in 2014, um, by which time the company had grown to 13 million turnover. Um, that saw the exit of Finance Wales and um, uh, an, another private equity investor called uh, Westbridge Capital came on board, along with Clydesdale Bank, to, um, to support the business. Um, in 2017, we went through our third management buyout. Um, this, this saw the exit of Westbridge Capital and uh, LDC came in as our, our investors and uh, we, uh, HSBC came alongside them. Um, by that time, the company had grown to 19 million turnover. Um, so we, in that time, we've launched new services, we've gone into new sectors, our headcount has more than doubled, um, and, and we continue to grow. So, for example, between February 2020 and May 2021, so sort of from pre-pandemic to almost coming out of the pandemic or for, from the lockdown periods anyway, we'd actually grown by, by more than 17% in, in revenue. So we, we continue to grow. And just in terms, I just, I'm sorry to push you, but I'm just interested in managing the process on, on preparation, the time, um, the resource it requires. I wonder what advice uh, you, you would give to other businesses, if, if you would. Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, so, so to achieve all that growth obviously sounds like it's a full-time job in itself, which it is. So, you know, what can you expect from fundraising and, um, you know, it, it from my experience, I was finance director when um, Westbridge uh, invested in 2014 and LDC invested in 2017. Um, I think it's safe to say it probably took up about half of my time. Um, so the, the whole process from beginning to end um, takes about 12 months, um, again, from the experience that we've had. Um, and, you know, you, you'll be heavily involved with advisors sort of um, in in a sales process um, where you, you'll be uh, developing an information memorandum, a business plan, presentations to investors. They can take you out to the business for several days. Um, you'll be involved with due diligence and this financial due diligence, commercial due diligence, all sorts of due diligence, more questions than you can ever imagine. Um, so and, and then a negotiation period, which is not only time consuming, but, it, you know, it, there's an emotional involvement in that as well, because you, you're talking about things that will have a personal impact on you and, and your sort of personal finances and, and your fellow shareholders, etc. Um, so I'd. I'd I'd say that the things that I'd advise people to do is, is prepare up front, um, particularly in terms of what, what are the resources that you need. So if you're going, if you're the CEO um, and you're you're also sort of leading sales or you're leading operations, um, you'll need somebody there to do that when you're not around, when you're doing those presentations, for example. Um, so is it that you need to recruit somebody and, and a second tier of management in place? Or is it that you need to train somebody up who's already in the business? So having that second tier of management is, is really important. Um, the other thing I'd say is um, do you, you do some housekeeping up front? So even before you sort of start to think about appointing an, an advisor, you know, what, what are the things that are going to trip you up in due diligence. So you think that somebody's going to come in and they're going to want to know all about um, your your contracts with your customers. They want to be sort of uh, scrutinizing your financial forecasts. They're going to want to know all about your employment contracts and relations with the employees. They're going to want to know all of these things. 
So what are the things that you can do up front that you think, oh, well, I've got an issue there and perhaps I, I could sort that out and, and get that ready so that you, you've done that well in advance so that when you're in that due diligence process that you, you don't, it doesn't come up as a surprise or an issue to somebody. You've already sort of boxed that off and, and sorted that out. Um, the other thing I'd say is sort of share the burden with your, your fellow directors or your managers, whoever you've sort of shared the information that you're going through this process with. Look at your work streams, you know, each week in advance, divide them up and, and make sure that um, you sort of run in the BAU activities alongside the, the, um, the, the investment um, uh, activities as well. Uh, we saw at Vista that was a positive experience. Um, you know, while we were out to the business, um, sort of doing the fundraising, actually it allowed other managers to step up and, and actually that was really uh, reassuring. Um, and then finally, I'd say have good advisors because they can help as well. You know, it could be that there's financial forecasts or something that, you know, perhaps they, they can actually come in and help you prepare those. So that there's lots of things that your advisor can do to help too. That's uh, wonderful stuff and, and fascinating. We could go on and talk about preparation for ages, but I've got to gallop on because uh, I want to take us on to valuation, uh, which is obviously another critical part of the story. To, to raise equity, uh, obviously you need to agree uh, on a valuation of uh, your business, and uh, this can obviously be a challenging part of uh, this process. So what advice is out there to uh, help this part go as smoothly as possible. Um, I wonder if it's uh, appropriate here to start with an investor perspective. Um, Alex Lee, what, what's your take on this, on valuation in, in particular, please? Certainly. I, I think uh, linked to valuation is the time of the fundraise. And the main purpose of fundraising is to get the cash into your business so that you can raise it. And you want to do that as quickly as possible so that it doesn't become a distraction. And I think with that, if you have very high expectations on valuation, you're going to prolong that fundraising process and risk not closing. So it's always good to have your valuation grounded in you know, firm offers from investors or you go to a corporate finance house and they'll give you a proper appraisal. That's what they do for a living. You're an entrepreneur, you run your business, you've created a lot, a lot of equity value. Um, it's about finding a fair market price that people are willing to invest at. And if that's high, Great. If it's not, you know, make sure that you get the cash into your business at all costs. Can I ask you uh, how much difference is there in valuing uh, your business for equity as a startup uh, and then uh, as a more established growing business? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think with an established growing business, you can rely on metrics, whereas with a startup, it's more relying on the story and the potential and the size of the market and what it might become. So it is more of an art, um, and there are various methods out there. At the end of the day, it probably comes down to the VC method, which is just looking at the level of potential dilution that the founder is going to suffer because, you know, say you're raising at a million pounds, is the business really worth a million pounds? If you tried to sell it, what would you get for that business? Sometimes it's a bit of software on a flash drive. You might get a hundred thousand pounds for it if you're very lucky. Um, so it's just about that fair exchange, making sure that the equity investors get a good stake and you get the cash to grow the rest of your equity. Patrick, let me bring, in, uh, bring you in here. How have uh, Hexagon found the uh, valuation process? I mean, it's a crunchy moment, isn't it? People like him rock up in the office and say, well, actually, you're not worth as much as you think, love. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah, you, you, you need to find that balance, uh, definitely. Well, I've got experience of Alex rocking up and telling <laughs> us it's not worth as much as we think it is. Um, but yeah, the market will tell you. It'll give you the answer. Uh, if people are saying no, then you've got to listen to that and you might have to rejig things a little. What's your advice for business on this particular issue, on valuation, given what you've been through? Uh, you have to have your story lined up. You have to have the opportunity. Being attractive but credible, I think, is, is definitely... If you go out there with an idea saying it's worth X, Y and Z, you need to back that up with some facts. Um, so you definitely have to have everything lined up before you, you even start going towards your valuation. Uh, and then the other one is, Alex is right, you've got to take the right amount of money to grow the business to the next step. If you're not taking enough money, you've got another 12 months to do a fundraise and you're going to run out of money. It's, you've got to pre-plan and you've always got to raise when you've got money. So you've got that, you haven't got that pressure as well, because if you're desperate, they'll squeeze you on your valuation. Yeah. 
Kuhn, quick final thought on valuation. I think, again, sort of leaning on what Patrick was saying, it's, a, it's again about sort of preparation, it's about data, it's about ensuring that you're in tune with, I think, obviously what the market is saying and that there aren't any surprises. Um, we all know that valuation obviously is a fine art, um, but I think there is a way of assisting the, your own sort of, I suppose, uh, opportunities and ensuring that you're constantly appraised of what you think obviously the, the data is telling you and how that compares to your own um, sort of valuation and, and how you sort of you, you, you support that with the, the, the story as, as a startup or equally as the data as a more established business. Jonathan, um, and this is often you in these situations as managing partner of Mountside Ventures. Um, a thought on valuation, please. And the, these often rather tense discussions of you're just not worth it, sorry. Um, so our, our golden rule with valuation is, <coughs> is very simple for founders, is never lead with the valuation or always let the market decide. And because if you say a number that's too low, then you know, great for the investor. If you say a number that's too high, then you might scare the investor away. So for us, the important thing is to ensure that the investor and the market decides what you're worth. And you can always do and use some of those methodologies that Alex was talking about in your back pocket to make sure that you know approximately what your range is. But it's always best to let the market decide and then have that negotiation alongside them. And then secondly to that, many, many investors know that it's very important to keep the management team incentivized. And so there's also there's always an element of ensuring that, you know, that the management team, the founders, the, the employees have got sufficient share options. And so ultimately, it's also in the best interest of the investor to ensure the valuation isn't too low, because without a properly incentivized management team, that business is not going to be able to generate sufficient returns um, applicable to that investor's appetite. And just staying with you for those many businesses who will be watching you today, um, just one piece of advice to anyone thinking of going here on valuation. Um, I think I think the the main bit is to, as I mentioned, let the let the investor decide and not come up with with a number. Um, and once you get to valuation, I think it's really important for founders to realise it's not all about valuation. Um, so there are many other terms within the heads of terms or within the term sheet that is also very critical to your to your company. And these might be the structuring and the preferences of those shares, whether the investor gets paid before or after the existing shareholders. It might be the founder vesting profile. So do the does the investor require you or the management team to stay on? for three, four years and to, to reclaim those shares. It might be those investor consent rights, so what you can and can't do um, with, with the company. And so valuation is important. Don't mention it in, until the, in the, in the investors mention it, but be very mindful that valuation isn't the all and end all. And there's a number of different things that you want to ensure that you work through to make sure that relationship with the investor is as good as it can be. OK, I know I'm going to be unpopular because I know lots of people will want to uh, talk more about valuation, but I've got to move on because uh, I want to go on to talk about a related uh, story. And it is, of course, value. Um, some businesses, of course, uh, tempted to go with investors uh, at this stage with the deepest pockets. So I, I want to ask all of our panelists why that might be a mistake. And Jonathan Hollis, as an advisor, let's start with you on this. Uh, what's your view on this, on, on, on value? Um, our view from working with, you know, a few hundred investors in the past, having worked very closely with them, it's that most investors, they want to add value to your, to your business. They want to support, you know, either they're exited entrepreneurs, they've gone through the journey and they want to give back, or they might be ex-consultants or bankers or ex-operators where actually, you know, they're really, they're, they want to get involved in that journey and ride that journey along with you. So I think the, the one thing to think about and to ensure that it's front of mind is that they want to help. The second um, thing that we often tell founders is not to expect it and always to be pleasantly surprised by it. And if you want support, to ask for it. Because often, you know, many investors, especially some of the mid to top tier investors, have got a large portfolio of companies. It might be 20, 30, 50, and even 100 plus for some organizations. And therefore, of course, if there's a large portfolio, it's difficult for investors to pay particular attention to every company in that portfolio. And so the key bit is if you have a very clear ask, often you'll be pleasantly surprised by the amount of support that those investors do. And you can have that ask 
maybe through an investor update. So every month you might produce an email. You, we, you know, you can you can use it. You can use a template to make sure of what you know some of the business highlights, some of the things that are going well, and crucially some of the challenges some of you asked. And if you say that and send that regularly once a month and have a very clear strategy, you know, for example, we're looking for a chairman, we're looking for a couple of more hires, we're looking for a bit of support on strategy, or simply we're looking for a client introduction. If you can be specific in those updates and those requests then often investors are more than willing to support you. Alex Lee, what are your thoughts and more to the point, what are your experiences on value? Yeah, I think it's uh, safe to say that the cash is not enough because once you get the investment in, if you don't know how to spend it, you won't get the growth and that won't set you up for your next round. So it's all about deploying it well. Um, and I think you, you definitely, you know, there's so much money around, you know, referred to as dry powder. You can get money, you know, if you've got a good business that's growing, you can get it from, you know, a lot of places. It's about selecting the right money from the right investor who can support you on that journey, um, that does have the time, resources, and experience to help guide you. You might be doing it for the first time. They see that across their large portfolio of 20, 30, 50 companies and can just help you navigate that journey. Um, Lisa, let's bring you in here, uh, Lisa Mayer-Page. I, I just want to ask about um, uh, what Vista uh, looked for in particular when deciding uh, on an investor to, uh, to work with. Yeah, sure. Um, I, th I think for us, it, it was making sure that the, the investor was aligned to our business plan. So, you know, we went through a, 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 a beauty parade sort of process where, um, you know, we... we um, had offers from a number of investors and you know you they get to sort of check you out as well as you get to check them out and and making sure that they are aligned to your business plan is is probably the most important thing so what is it in your business plan that you're looking to achieve is it the sales growth is it the development of technology or product or acquisitions and and how is it that that investor can support you have they done it before um and are they bought into your sort of story um so so that was really important for us um touched on similarly you know sort of what's the impact on you personally is it that you know one of the shareholders wants to to make an exit at, during the process um is it that um some people want to take some cash out um you know you obviously want to have a look at the investment structure and see whether that sort of suits all of the the shareholders as well so that's a, an important consideration um their, their credentials in your sector are really important um and and for us ldc had invested in in one of our suppliers which was in a, a um a, a tech back logistics sort of um uh, business called Buybox, and we work closely with them. So, you know, it was good for us that we were able to to speak to them and understand how they got on with LDC, and that turned out to be a, a successful investment for them too. Um, so, you know, what what other investee companies has the investor got? Will you be able to meet with them? Perhaps there's business that you could be doing with them, and and so on. Um, another thing is is their style. Um, so you know we we had calls with a number of uh, potential investors. Some were going to be, I think, more passive than others. Others were going to be more aggressive. And you know it depends what you want really. Um, some people might be really willing to go on and make loads of money and and have that aggressive investor on board, and that's great. Whereas others may think, well, that, that that's a bit too much for me. And actually, I, I want to sort of um, have somebody who's who's not going to be pushing us as hard as that. So, you know, try and get a feel for, for what their style is. And, and you can reference them. So speak to their um, their investee companies, speak to some companies who have exited, um, speak to your advisors. Um, also speak to some companies where, where things haven't gone so well and understand how supportive they are. I think that's really important too. Um, what, one of the things with LDC in comparison to our previous investors, Westbridge, is LDC being a bigger investor. They've got this big value creation team, um, so a team of sort of about a dozen professionals. They're, they're all ex-industry and they can really help with, um, you know, your sales plan or your marketing, um, operational efficiencies, you name it. Um, and, and they've got an expert who can come in and help you with that. So, so that's also something that, that's important to take into account. Um, the level of involvement that they have, you know, if it's too much, um, it, some 
people don't want a, an investor too involved in them. When we've talked about there's the veto rights, but you know it, some of their style may be that they they want to be coming down and seeing you every week, and then others may be more hands off. So that's something that's important to consider as well. Um, one other thing that was important for us was the the type of fund. So. As an example, Westbridge, we were a, a, a VC fund is made up of discrete funds quite often. And Westbridge, um, we were in one of those discrete funds and they were looking to raise a new fund. So one of the sort of uh, drivers for them to uh, exit from Vista was the fact they were doing a new fundraise and, you know, they wanted to demonstrate a, a profitable exit as part of that fundraise. So, you know, that was part of their rationale. Um, whereas LDC, for example, are an evergreen fund, um, so they they may take a longer term view on investment than than a, a you know a, a fund that's structured like Westbridge. To understand that is really important too. Um, so yeah, there's lots of things to think about. Yeah, no, and well explained as well. Uh, Shu and I, I just want a final thought on this, and and perhaps the importance that the uh, investor and the business uh, are perhaps aligned on their values. I mean, perhaps appropriate to be talking about this during COP26, um, and in particular, their social and environmental impact. That's becoming an issue now, much more than it was, Absolutely. even if we sat here 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah, entirely. I think you could probably go as far as to say it's probably at the forefront now of um, an entrepreneur's sort of um, objective is to sort of almost find um, the impact investor. Obviously, Lisa just touched upon a really important point there around a green fund, for example, um, and understanding, I suppose, the measurement of, of how that differs if you, for example, are tapping into a green fund. Um, I think investors do probably now have the opportunity to also co, to co sort of, uh, co-invest um, and develop a double social or double bottom line. I think there's a lot more emphasis now on social value, environmental factors and what that means for an investor. And equally like, again, um, circling back around to what Lisa said, from an entrepreneur's perspective, that could actually mean that the investment is sort of in a longer, longer term and the measurement of that investment sort of really needs to be bottomed out. Um, in terms of what the investor expect as that social and environmental impact because actually it's not like a a common sort of investment where you could be measured on performance etc it could actually be greater than that in terms of the impact that investment would have on the business's social or environmental factors we could talk about this for Absolutely. ages Absolutely, but it's, it's fascinating isn't it we have to move on i'm sorry and apologies if you want want a bit more on this but we've got a packed schedule i need to talk about um first time equity because lots of you um, have said you're interested in this if a business is looking to uh raise equity investment for the first time uh, where do you start uh, and what are the key things uh you need to do initially let's start this and um, perhaps on the investor side. And Alex, let's start with you on first time equity. Yeah, I think the, the first thing to do is get your mindset right. You know, get, you know, you're going to have other people scrutinizing your business and you need to be ready for that. So you want to have everything prepared. You want to have all your investor materials prepared. You want to have your, you know, all your housekeeping in order, all your regulatory filings done. So nothing comes as a surprise to you or investors. And I think in terms of advice, I would go and speak to other entrepreneurs who have done it, who have been through it. They're going to help guide you uh, and learn what to expect. Equally, I would speak to uh, corporate financiers. You know, we've got Mount Side Ventures here. Someone like that who can guide you. They will help add value. Um, and, you know, it, it's always worth the money that you pay for good quality advice, whether that's legal, you know, accounting, uh, fundraising. Um, yeah. Jonathan Hollis, a thought from you on this. Um, I think, um, so we've got plenty of information and resources on our website. So we've got um, pitch templates, VC lists, angel network lists. So feel free to jump on. It's all available for free and to download. Um, my advice is um, spend a lot of time on the prep phase mm -hmm. and make sure you have effectively a minimum viable data room and a minimum viable investor readiness documents, which includes um, a pitch deck, a investor FAQ, which is effectively just a list of questions you'd expect to be asked 
it includes a financial model, specifically if you're raising an institutional equity round rather than just an angel um, equity round. It includes an investor tracker template to make sure that you've got everything in the CRM and you know exactly what the conversation should and shouldn't happen. Um, make sure you've got a data room um, and there's five or six key areas within the data room, which effectively is the housekeeping that we've been talking um, about earlier. Um, and as well as that, a really clear and succinct cap table uh, because you will find that if you have a good, good cap table with all the information that's accurate, that helps you in the negotiation phase when you're talking about evaluation with the company. And if you've got those six key areas uh, nailed down, that's when you can start your investor campaign and your investor relationships. And the main reason why it's so critical to have the information available is effectively to build competitive tensions in the process. Because if you start the fundraise and you go speak to you know, Alex, for example, and Alex asks you to provide a financial model and it takes you three weeks to answer the question, it's very clear to Alex and to others that actually this is the first investor you're speaking to and you're not speaking to any other funds. And therefore that doesn't create much of a FOMO or a competitive tension in the deal. But if you apply within 24 hours, it's clear that you've been asked that question before and that you provide additional credibility that you know what you're doing and you've got the required documents. All the trade secrets are falling out of the cupboard here now, aren't they? Um, Shu, when businesses come into you, I mean, what do you tell them um, when they come to you for advice on, uh, on equity to start? I think we, we basically hammer home the importance of being sort of prepared. So what we do advise is, uh, as part of obviously the Accelerated Growth Programme, we've got a network of entrepreneurs that have been there, done that, bought the T-shirt, and in effect, what we ask, ask all of the entrepreneurs is to, that are looking to raise sort of equity is to come forward. And what we can do, for example, is build a power panel, if you like, around them that gives them the opportunity to dry run, if you like, their sort of pitch to an investor that would highlight any gaps, any potential areas of development. And equally, going back to sort of a lot of what we've heard just now in terms of that sort of um, housekeeping is to ensure that they have the right documentations, hidden questions, and also the entrepreneurs that have been there before can share their knowledge in terms of what caught them out and how they would pass on, obviously, the learning to, if you like, the, the, the startups that are looking to move forward with that equity investment raise. Let's bring in um, our uh, businesses' experience. Um, Lisa, if I can start with you. Um, Lisa Mayer-Page from uh, Vista. Thoughts on first-time equity and the mistakes. Tell us about the stuff that goes wrong. We're much more interested in that. <laughs> I don't know too much about that. But um, what, one thing I would say, I mean, to add to what everybody else has said about all of the getting things ready really early, the housekeeping, having good advisors on board and, and so on, you know, they're, they're all really good. But but also there's, there's a very human side to this. You know, you're talking about people's shareholdings, people's own business and you, your colleagues who you work with. So one of the things um, I'd add to the things that you need to do up front is um, ensure that the team are aligned in terms of what you're looking to achieve. And if you're not aligned, have those discussions up front as well. So one of the things that we dealt with um, uh, in one of our investments um, at Vista was the, the managing director said, OK, I, at some point in this next tenure, I want to uh, retire from the business. And that was really good to have that um, thought about up front so that we could ensure that the investor who was going to back us was aligned to that as well. And we've had those discussions and we could structure the, the investment and the documents in a way that could enable that change to happen. And when the change did happen, it happened smoothly. So I, th I think that's one thing I would, would add. Um, Patrick, what about your experiences in, in Hexagon? Uh, I would say for first time equity, it's good to have an advisor. Uh, it's good to start speaking to your investors well before you're even planning around. Uh, they, if you speak to the investors, you get an understanding of the business, they come along with you and they'll tell you what they want to hear. Uh, so they'll tell you what they want in their pack, uh, as you said, so there'll, there'll be basics in there. But be, be ready for some awkward questions as well. Um, now, talking of awkward questions, it won't surprise you to hear there are awkward questions from people watching. So uh, you're being thrown at the deep end here, so my apologies. But this is what it's all about. It's live, by the way. It's none of that usual recorded stuff. So uh, you can ask whatever you want. Um, so here we go. 
uh, on, uh, on the art of fundraising. I'm pooling lots of stuff together, otherwise we'll end up going through 10 of the same questions, so forgive me if I don't call out names on all of them. But broadly, um, first question uh, to all panellists, uh, is there value in having a mix of debt and equity together? Um, Shuan, you can start us on that. I think it's all about sort of understanding the sort of the future of of your business. I think one thing that we see quite often is that entrepreneurs do make um, decisions in isolation in terms of okay, well here I am at this particular raise, um, and I have obviously got a mix of obviously debt and equity. Um, but what does that mean for future potential fundraising opportunities that I'm that I'm obviously going to be looking for? So I think there needs to be a very sort of balanced viewpoint in terms of okay, is this the right mix in terms of obviously the current makeup of obviously the investment that I have, and does that have any futuristic implications on what I do next? if I ever do need to sort of take more investment, for example, or change tact, et cetera. Alex, uh, what about you? The question is, is there value in having a mix of debt and equity together? I think if you can get debt, I would go for it. Mm -hmm. Most businesses can't. Obviously, make sure you don't overextend yourself. Yeah. Um, and to Shuin's point, you know, which journey are you on? Are you looking to pay down that debt? Or are you looking as part of a, an exit, a management buyout? Mm -hmm. Or are you on an equity scale-up journey because that debt might mess up your balance sheet and your cap table and lots of convertible loans um, and that might impend your future fundraising. So figure out which journey you're on. I'm, I'm banging through these very, very fast. So apologies if we don't get to all of our panelists, but it's important to try and get all of these questions on. Next one, is it always best to start with a single investor? Jonathan, can you, can you deal with that please? Is it always best to start with a single investor on the art of fundraising? Um, I think the answer is it depends, like many of these questions, and I think it depends on many things. It depends on the ability of that investor to follow on. So we talked about, you know, whether it's always important to have the value, value add versus the size of the fund. If that investor can support you in later rounds, then it might be less of an issue having one single investor. It also depends on the strategic alignment. If that a single investor can provide sufficient value at different stages, it might also make sense to have a single investor. It probably doesn't make sense to have a single investor where, <coughs> as an example, um, you know, that, that investor is it might not be able to support your particular thesis, your particular business. So, you know, if they're, in, if they're an agnostic investor and you run a regulatory business or you run a healthcare specialist business or a life sciences business and you work with an agnostic investor, it might make more sense to also include a strategic investor on board as well. I'm just going to squeeze one more question in here, if I may, and it is this. Does equity suit one type of sector or industry more than another. Lisa, can you deal with that? Does equity suit one type of sector or industry more than another? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. Um, what, what I would say is what, one of the things that an equity investor is looking for is, is growth. So, you know, what they're looking for is a business that can grow to a, a sizable amount and give them the return that they need to their investors um, and also cash returns. So they, an investor will be looking for a high growth business where the EBITDA will grow or the market share will grow, something that will give an increase in the valuation over a period of three to five years, as well as, you know, if you're a, a trading business, um, cash generation will also be key. Um, so perhaps that will suit more some businesses rather than others. Thank you for that. Now, th and thank you for your questions, by the way. Keep them coming. I'm just going to go around our panel now for closing remarks and, uh, and perhaps the one thing that our panellists think that we should uh, all take away from this session. Alex, so on first time uh, equity, perhaps, what is the one piece of advice, the one thing we should take away? I, I think it's that there, there isn't time to make mistakes. Um, you have to get it right first time, otherwise um, it might not work out. So make sure that you are malleable, take on advice, you know, ask people for help. There's people that have done this 100, 100 times before you. Um, let them help you and you'll all be successful together. I, should, I shouldn't be so indiscreet, but before we put the microphones on, you said to me that it was interesting watching businesses make the same mistakes time after time, which is pretty damning, really. But it's true, isn't it? I mean, businesses do make the same mistakes on this time after time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think that's why 
We need to raise the level of education, make it more freely available, um, and it just brings it back to that point of having a, a value add investor from the outset to help you on that journey and advisors that can help you uh, not make those same mistakes because it, it really is criminal. And I think if the level of education was out there and support, the startup st statistics would be far, far better with exactly the same ingredients. Jonathan Hollis, he makes a fair point, doesn't he? And you do wonder, well, you know, why do we keep on making mistakes in this area? Why, why isn't it easier? Why don't we stop making these mistakes? Of course, and that's one of the areas that we spend the most amount of time in. You know, although we work with maybe 15 to 20 companies a year, we produce materials, resources for as many companies as possible. So I think one, one of the main key takeaways, I think, across all the panelists is make sure you do your prep and make sure that you are investor ready before going out to investors. If only because you have to realize that as soon as you send your deck to an investor, mm. all investors have CRMs and then that deck in, is now in their database forever. And it's very difficult to then go back. And, and if you go back with a you know different deck or you haven't hit your metrics, that's a very difficult conversation to have. Um, and then I'd say that if you're looking for resources, just jump on our website, Mountside Ventures. As I mentioned, there's angel lists and VC lists and templates. And one of the things that we spend a lot of our time doing from speaking to investors and startups is to produce a lot of material for as many companies as possible. And one of those things, for example, is, and actually Alex has contributed to this, is we've, we're launching a term sheet report at the end of the month where uh, around 250 funds have told us what are their typical terms and we're making that available for entrepreneurs so that when you're having those conversations with the investors you know what is market and what is not market and those are some of the initiatives that we're doing to try and uh, bridge that gap and uh, support companies with the fundraising process from an ed educational perspective Chu and final thoughts uh, on this session um um, well, again, obviously, uh, I think we've all we've all highlighted the importance of preparation, um, and I think also I think there's something to be said for developing your own resilience as well, because ultimately this is a challenging time as an entrepreneur in raising equity. I think it needs obviously some attention in developing your own resilience to deal with the challenges that come with it. But equally, again, as we've heard all morning, really. It's about having your preparation on point, being able to gather a peer-to-peer -peer network um, around you and also to lean on, like, a, like we, we've heard as well, is the people that have been there before. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, there we're going to end uh, this particular panel. So my sincere thanks to uh, our panellists who've taken part uh, in this first session this morning. Uh, you've been listening to uh, Alex Lee, Jonathan Hollis, uh, Shuan Rees, uh, Lisa Mayer-Page and Dr. Patrick Dodds. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us and thank you all for your valuable insight both here in the studio uh, and remotely. And that